Um, I would like to announce um, today's speaker. We have Sarah Gardner with us who chimed in during the Bee Share. Thank you. Sarah is involved in many cool projects. I'm hoping that she might uh, share a little of that too. Uh, bee surveys and, and, and um, bees in their role in First Nation traditional food pollination. But tonight, I think she's going to be discussing, uh, focusing on bee mites, both beneficial and harmful mites. So Sarah, tell us all about it. Uh, thank you, Kate. That was yeah. a really nice intro. Um, I just want to say that this is a really cool and enigmatic group. I don't think you understand how unique this series of people are. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, I'd like to first thank your president and chair, David Jennings, for reaching out to me and asking me to join you today. And um, I, yeah, so as Kate mentioned, I do work with the local tribes in Eastern Oregon. So some of the projects that we have been looking at for the last five years are the uh, pollinators on culturally important food plants, which they refer to as first foods. So we're gonna be continuing that work this year. We're doing a, a kicking off a two-year project starting in April, where we're going to be looking at full bee diversity across the reservation and tying that diversity and the additional host plants that those bees are visiting to the um, pollinators or first foods. So I'm really excited about that project. Um, I am also involved in mentoring for the Oregon Bee Atlas. So that's one of my primary roles, uh, which is how I actually met David Jennings. And um, for those of you who participate in my mentor sessions, this is going to be um, a, a little familiar <laughs> content for you. But um, yeah, so tech, uh, typically I like to give a uh, sort of fun natural history primer to, to different topics related to our native solitary bees interdigitated between dense taxonomic <laughs> information. So we'll go through like identification for a, a month and then the next month I'm like, all right, let's take a breather. We're gonna talk about mites, which is how this talk came to be. So are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. I am. Yes. Excellent. With the slides on the side though. Slides on the side? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, hold on. It's not the public view, it's the um, presenter view. Let's see here, speaker and... Is that better? No. No, that didn't work? Nope. So if you just click on from beginning up at the upper left-hand corner, yeah. that work. Okay. How's that? Yes. <laughs> Hot dog. Here we go. Um, okay. Yeah, my Zoom is getting fussy. I don't know why. There's always something. It was perfect before, right? Oh no, it dropped me. <laughs> it was too much. Oh. Okay, here we go. How's that? Great. Okay. Hopefully that'll stay. All right. So, uh, yeah.
uh, I wanted to kind of break up the the dense taxonomic topics with a interesting natural history. Wow. Okay. Is anyone else having problems with Zoom or is it just me? It, it might be you. And, you know, one suggestion is you might want to um, take off your video. It might help a little bit. Just... Your personal video. Yes, that's all I meant. But yeah, it looks great on this side. Yeah, she's froze. It'll give us an opportunity to read all this. And I mean, she does put on a, a talk for us every month as part of the Oregon Bee Project um, oh. out of state mentored element. So normally it works fine. The Zoom for her. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that her photos have disappeared now because I, I mean, I was looking at the mites. <laughs> I'm sure they'll come back soon. There's nothing worse than tr trying to be in the middle of a Zoom and everything just falling apart. And you're like, but why? It, it works it, every other day. It, <laughs> it never fails. And we've practiced together. So there was nothing wrong with it before. I don't know. It might be. Um, maybe she added Yeah, I'm sure. Did she? Did she entirely? Like, is she entirely out of the thing? Okay. No, there you are. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I can troubleshoot. All right, here we go. So suggestion: You might want to take off your video. I don't know if you heard me before, but that sometimes helps um, your personal video. I think it was my Zoom account through uh, one college was being fussy. Okay. And we'll see if this works better. Oh, I How's just that? thought you were trying to hold us ransom for more money as a speaker fee. <laughs> That's we'll a double president it. We'll move. double the pay. <laughs> oh, good. Two high fives. All right. Um, okay. So, um, I do, I do like to talk about natural history of different insects. My, my base education is entomology, but um, bees are my specialty. So I like to round out these taxonomic topics with something a little bit more fun. So I decided um, at the request of one of my mentees to look into bee and mite associations. And I gotta say, it is a incredibly dense topic. And I'm just gonna scratch the surface here, but um, there's a lot of information out there and it's absolutely fascinating. So mites are actually found in eusocial and solitary bee species, um, as well as olipodia. So that's bees and the four um, hunting wasp families. And um, there are facultatively ob obligate mites that do occur on solitary bees, which we'll cover a little bit more in detail. But Hymenoptera in general, they have these uh, commensal or deleterious or even symbiotic mites in their environment. So one of the examples that people com commonly know about is Varroa destructor. So that is the ectoparasitic mite that occurs on honeybees that uh, is causing a ton of problems in the beekeeping industry. These mites feed on the fat bodies of the bee, not the actual hemolymph. So they feed on the fat bodies of developing and adult honeybees. And in addition to the actual, you know, feeding, they also transmit disease. So they're um, pushing viral loads and bacterial loads into these honeybees as well as just bringing them down a peg or two in terms of their physical rigor. These uh, mites are spread from B to B contact, generally out in the field. And that is through what is called a phoretic 
mite. So phoretic mites have little legs. They're able to actually move around, and that is the phoretic stage of these particular mites. So they phoretic mites also travel through the honeybee colony looking for open brood cells, which they can then lay eggs in. However, these ectoparasites are extremely rare. This is not the standard. Um, typically, when you see mites as a true um, parasite, they're actually um, a kleptoparasite. So they're, they're going after the brood cell provision rather than the actual physical body of the bee. So there's only about 6% of the mite genera that are true parasites on the adult bees. And mites are found in solitary bee nests of um, most of the bee families. So associations have been found in all bee families, but the bee family malidity. So this figure here is from the solitary bees text. So it's a phylogeny which depicts the relationships of bees and each of the bee families is indicated with its name along with a branch of the relationships that go into a subfamily. Malidity is actually the basal branch of the tree. So that is the ancestor to all bees at this point in our understanding. Mites occur on every other bee family. So that indicates that the ancestor of bees did not have mites, but the next branch on the chain that's when mites started to take advantage. So they're found in apidae, megachylidae, andranidae, helictidae, calididae, and stenotridae. Um, however, there are some bee families where they're seen more um, prevalently than others. Typically, these mites are either beneficial or neutral, so they're commensal. They don't actually influence the bee host. There's no um, found, say, decrease in body weight of the bee or anything like that. Um, typically, these mites are even um, able to control bad bacteria or fungi that grow within the brood cell of um, these solitary bees, but also some eat pollen and nectar. Um, most of the time, it's in small quantities. For the most part, uh, these mites are most commonly found on the, the bodies of the subfamily Xylocopini, which includes our Xylocopa and Ceratina. Those are the carpenter bees and the Megachylidae. So you guys were talking about the um, pronunciation of these Latin names. It's Megachylidae, um, Megachylini, Osmia, and Megachyli. So Osmia megachyli, that's the mason and leaf cutter bees. They have a common thing when you look at their brood cells um, compared to Xylocopa and Ceratina, where they are unlined the, um, in many species. They're partitioned. So you'll see like pieces of masticated leaf, mud, um, different, little pebbles, things in their environment that they use to separate out their cells. But within the nest structure, a lot of them don't actually create a brood cell that is lined with, say, leaf pieces or mud. Um, so the mites are actually able to move through these kind of superficial partitions and go to brood cell to brood cell, which is one of the hypotheses of why they're um, prevalent in the xylocopini and megachylini. They are also found often in helictidae. And the reason for that is hypothesized because helictidae often show communal or social nesting. So there's a concentration of these bees in a certain place the mites can kind of go gangbusters and they can get into a certain area and do very well just because there's a lot of bees to choose from. And also there are a few lineages of mites that can burrow through the soil. So helictidae are ground nesting and if mites can burrow through the soil, then you know they, they can get to all of the brood cells that they want. 
So I'm gonna get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of the taxonomy of these mites. And that's because it is associated with how the mites behave and um, either mutualisms or parasitism in the bees as well. So the mites are found in superorder Acariformes. There's three different orders that are found to um, inhabit bee nests. And that's somewhat based actually on body size. There's the astigmata, which are small bodied, the prostigmata, which are medium bodied, <laughs> and the mesostigmata, which are larger, larger bodied. So the astigmata, they can occur at high densities and they can occur at high densities in nests of small bees, such as Lazioglossum. A lot of these astigmata are commensal. So they don't actually really have an effect on the bees. They just eat a little bit of the pollen provision here and there. They're um, oftentimes phoretic. So that means that there are multiple different stages of the mites. The phoretic stage is the one where they actually move around. So in this diagram, I have indicated different families of these mites, as well as the common genera found in bee nests. So with the, say, Anetus mites, I've put a little plus sign here, which means it's a positive mite for the bee. These are often associated again with uh, small body bees like Lazioglossum. And what they typically do is they're fungivores. So they'll go through the brood cell and because of the nature of the pollen provision, it's a very wet material. It often will grow fungal hyphae on the sides of the brood cell. It can actually kill the larva if it gets too bad. So these anetus will, let, will snack on the fungal hyphae and keep the brood cell clean. There's Sarah? also, yeah. We have a question coming in. So I just wanted to clarify that it's okay for people to um, speak up and ask questions or type in the chat. Oh, sure. Yeah. Go for it. Aiden, go ahead. Interrupt me. I love it. <laughs> okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about when you were speaking about like mites eating pollen in the brood cells. Um, like from my experience with mason bees, it seems to be like really detrimental to the brood cells rather than like a neutral experience for the bees, I suppose, like any of the brood cells that I open up that end up being empty or just filled with like a mass of pollen mites. I'm just yeah. interested what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. So those mites are probably in the family Ketodactylidae. So Ketodactylus, it's here on the bottom left, it has a little negative sign, and that's because they will actually consume the pollen provision until the larva has nothing left and they die. So those are kleptoparasitic to the detriment of the bee. They don't actually kill the bee directly, but they eat all of its resources. And those are the bees that are, or those are the mites that are um, typically seen in that density that you're talking about. So you'll open a brood cell thinking that you'll find an Osmia lignaria and you find it just teeming full of mites. And you're like, wow, that's kind of gross. And also, like what happened and and that's that situation the anitas mites they they eat their fill and there's no uh, detriment to the bee ketodactylus is actually a genus that will consume until the bee is dead yeah that's a great question cool. thank you yeah uh there are the prostigmata the medium bottom, medium bodied uh, mites that are actually beneficial to the bees. In the genus Kilo, uh, Kilophys, they are associated with xylocopene and they are predaceous on the astigmata. So these mites are actually ones that the bees will carry around with them very intentionally so that they can protect their brood cells 
from the detrimental catodactylus mites because they basically have an army backing them up. Um, and then there's these larger bodied mites. They're mostly um, free living predators that also go after not necessarily other brood cell mites, but other deleterious uh, infections such as nematodes that occur in the brood cells. And that can be found in the Nomia melanderi or the um, alkali bee. And I like to keep things super professional. So I just drew a little life cycle of a, a typical astigmata life cycle um, that is commensal. So we have, we'll start at a uh, adult bee that has these mites covering her um, mesosoma and metasoma. She visits a flower and the mites will deposit upon that flower. Other bees will visit then that flower and pick them up. These adult mites, they'll bring them to their brood cells and those adult mites will drop off into the brood cells and then um, just either remain inert or actually lay eggs. So if the mites lay eggs, they will hang out in certain um, life stages, the ones that are not deleterious to the bee. They'll hang out in certain life stages waiting for the bee to get to its own life stage. And then that's when the bee will start to defecate. Those mites will then get to their deutonymphal stage, start consuming the fungal hyphae that we talked about, and then develop into adult mites. So it's um, without the uh, uh, any impact on the bee itself. So then you only have female bees at that point. They'll lay unfertilized eggs, which will turn into male. Those male will then meet, uh, mate with the, their parental generation females, inseminate them. Those females will lay eggs, which will quickly develop into the phoretic mite stage, which will attach to the body of the bees, which then will leave the nest and go to a flower and so on and so on. What's really interesting is for the most part, bees are not changing their natural history, their lifestyle, their development to compensate for these mites. The mites are just kind of in their environment. However, the mites, have a ton of different adaptations, including these really burly pretarsal claws and these suckers that allow the phoretic stage to attach to the body of the adult bee um, and you know, spread them around. There are exceptions though, where some of the bees have actually developed certain structures to um, keep these mites where they want them. And if, you know, it wasn't heartbreaking enough that some of these deleterious mites can be spread, you know, just through going to a flower, dispersal can also, or like uh, burrowing through the soil, dispersal can also occur through our friends, the kleptoparasitic bees. So when the kleptoparasites enter the, the uh, host nest, they may be covered with the, say, catodactylus mites and deposit them. And um, that's, a, that's a sad situation. So for instance, in the Pacific Northwest, we could see that relationship with the Delicostelis laticin, uh, laticincta, pardon me, and Megachyla angularum, its host. But when mites are beneficial to the bees, they actually ha uh, have evolved these structures to contain them so that they can intentionally distribute them into their brood cells. And those are called a carinaria or a carinarium. And these will uh, collect and give safe harbor to the phoretic mites. So this um, particular image shows a serotina and on its uh, near its axilla, it's actually developed these 
uh, pits that can contain a few of its symbiotic mites. So I have a question. Yes. Um, where in the evolutionary cycle did this relationship between mites and bees begin? I mean, was it was it like like from the beginning, or was there something that caused mites to realize that they're benefiting from bees? So mites have relationships with almost every insect order. And some of them are not um, specialized to insects um, of even certain order or genera. They'll switch from a hemipteran to a hymenopteran. So the evolution of these particular acarinaria, um, it has been looked at, but it hasn't been looked at since the phylogenetic phylogenetic um, clarity that we gained in 2019. So those answers still need to be looked at. <laughs> I am not quite sure, Tony. Uh, so these are Karen area. Oh, do you have more questions? Sorry. No, I'm just saying thank you for, for that. It's interesting to know. Yeah, yeah. Mites are really crazy. So these are carrion area that can be found on almost every single part of the adult bee, including um, between the pronotum and the mesosoma. The uh, mesosoma itself is indicated here, the metasoma. So uh, that would be in specific structures that we'll look at on xylocopa, as well as the genital tract. So xylocopa fimbriata has developed a chamber that is just to the side of the genital tract to harbor these mites. And one of the genera that you guys are probably pretty familiar with, which is Lazioglossum, often has phoretic mites attached to them. It's one of the ways that you can actually identify them to species, which is really cool. So these Acarinaria are typically found on the anterior side of the first tergite, so T1. So I'm going to go into a little bit of um, a key association, so the description from a dichotomous key and where these structures are found on the body of the bee. And um, most of these uh, lazioglossomites are found in a family of a stigmata again because they're really really small because lazioglossum are super small. Uh, there's one exception of Imeripes vulgaris, which is found in association with lazioglossum tatusi, which is a uh, bee that is commonly found in the Pacific Northwest. So instead of attaching to the anterior side of the first tergite they attach to the propodial hair, which I will show you in just a moment. So this is a classic paper by McGinley. This shows all of the different types of a carinaria on Lazioglossum, and they vary in um, hair plumosity, abundance, and the shape of the actual um, vacancy in between these two kind of mustaches coming together on the first tergite. So just to kind of clear up what these pictures mean, this is the anterior side of the T1. So it's if you were taking the abdomen of the bee, which is, we'll say it's turned sideways, but then you flip it and you bring it head on and you're looking straight on at the first tergite. So right here is where it would join in with the mesosoma. So the acarinaria on lazioglossum are these circular structures of hair, and they can be erect, oppressed. There can be this kind of channel in between these patches of erect or oppressed hairs. So you actually have to measure how big those spaces are and how circular those um, 
hairs are on the, the body of these lasioglossum. One of the examples, uh, again, is lasioglossum tatusi. So this is part of the dichotomous key couplet that gets you to this species. And I just wanted to um, focus on some of the morphology of this bee. Um, there's a bunch of language that talks about like the face, the fronds, the ocelli, these, you know, light um, capturing structures on, that are near their eyes, as well as if they have mites, they are clinging to the propodial hairs. So that is again, the mesosoma rather than the metasoma. So that's a good way if you're looking at museum specimens that have mites attached, it's a good way to tell to two see apart from other lasioglossum. And these carinaria can actually occur on males as well as females. So mites don't really have a preference necessarily of whether or not they're on a male bee or a female bee, because eventually the male bee will transfer them to a female bee, which will get them to the brood cell. So they will aggregate on male bees. But interestingly, not necessarily in the same place on the same species of bee when you're looking at males and females. So this is a paper that came out in 2007 looking at those ketodactyl mites on xylocopa. And you can see there's a bunch of different places of, xylo, um, of mites on these different bee bodies. But I really wanted to focus on the males and females. So these are the same species. The mites aggregate on the female, which is on the left here, between the uh, mesosoma and the metasoma. But on the male, it's on the pronotum. They're just like right there. And there's been discussion whether or not that could allow the bees to just jump off the body of the male and strategically land on the female during copulation. But I haven't seen a paper come out with that yet. And one of my favorite, absolutely favorite examples of extreme um, might a carinaria are found on the body of Xylocopa ruficeps, which is a bee not found in the United States, but it just shows you how these symbiotic relationships have um, gotten pretty specialized. So this image okay. on the left is a Xylocopa abdomen that has been removed from the bee. So this is the first tergite anterior view. So this is where it would join with the mesosoma. And there's this pore, this opening, right here at the top of T1. And that actually enters, this is a posterior side of the first tergite that enters this little chamber that is on the inside of the bee. When they, the, the researchers opened this structure, they actually found a pile of these symbiotic mites in the genus Dinogamasis. The relationship of these mites is crazy. So they actually will clean the cuticle of a developing larvae and pupa to keep it from fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens. And, and it's so beneficial to this bee species that they have evolved the structure so that the, the female xylocopa, because they are multi-generation per year, they can actually bring their offspring, <laughs> these mites, and drop them off so that they can then clean them. It's amazing. But there's also other mites that have taken advantage of these kind of um, uh, protective structures. So you'll see here in this image on the bottom right, there's synertia mites, which are teeny tiny little mites that do consume a little bit of the pollen provision. So they're not doing a lot of harm to the bee. Um, no mortality has been in, uh, found because of these tiny mites, 
but it's just one of those commensal mites that we discussed before. I have if another you... question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can we assume that every bee that we see has mites, car is carrying mites? I would say that the majority of mites or majority of bees that I collect do not carry mites on them. Um, and that's just through a lot of collection, but certain bees do carry mites, like the, the ones that do have the acarin area, like the Blasio glossum, take a good look at those and you will frequently see mites. Um, but bees like, well, obviously the, the, um, malidity don't carry mites because right. again, that's that oh, basal right. branch of the phylogeny. Right. The calidity don't often carry mites. Those are the cellophane bees. And there's, yeah, there's certain subfamilies that don't, uh, that, that it's more abundant, these, these mite interactions. And that's, again, probably based on their natural history, their nesting um, of the lack of brood cell walls. So they, they have these basically naked brood cells that the mites can get into pretty easily. Interesting, thanks. Yeah. Can I ask another question as well? Sure. Um, so is there any way of knowing like if these like form these like for example, I don't remember what the name of the the structure was on the previous bee that went inside the metazoma. Um, but like, are those structures existing previously, and mites exploit them, and then bees, like through natural selection, are maybe like making those structures better for the mites, or like how does the relationship like what direction is the relationship going? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, definitely. So with the extreme structure of this particular Acarin area, this is a evolved structure. So this is compensating for those symbiotic relationships in my humble opinion. So there might've been a depression here on the Xylocopa that then a mite found safe harbor in, and then over 15,000 years, that became this incredible internal Icarin area where the, the mites are actually aggregating. Um, for, yeah, for the most part, like I mentioned in the previous slide, bees are not adapting their morphology to carry these mites around because they don't really have an effect on their um, on their brood cells. They don't have an effect on any any sort of life stage. But when they do, and it's extreme, like these mites clean the cuticular surface of these larvae and pupa, um, that's when you see these crazy acarin area. But this is this is atypical for sure. The Lazio glossum, um, multiple different mite species can be found in their acarin area on their um, metasoma, which brings us to what I kind of a... mite do you have? Yeah, what? Um, so I just was looking through my iNaturalist and I have a picture of that, uh, the Tutusi. Uh -huh. Is that how you? I was wondering if you could just show the slide really quick so I could take a screenshot so I can compare it to the ones I have. You bet. Thank I, I you was, so much. What, this was the one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. no problem. Uh, I can also share out my resources to anyone who is interested in them, um, which I've listed them at the end of this discussion. But did I did I cover your question, Aiden? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's it's really fascinating, and, and I think basically my understanding is that any 
B with an Acarin area has a relationship, like a positive relationship with mites, basically. Yes, and okay. that doesn't mean that other mites won't take advantage of those structures. Right. But there is an overwhelming positive that keeps those structures in place, even gotcha. if you do get some nasty mites along the way. Like we were talking about the Sinertia mites taking advantage of, and, and this is how it could have even originated. So you have this huge opening going into a big internal Acarin area. It could have happened like this. You have an aggregation of these mites in this depression. And if the Sinertia were actually beneficial over time, over 30,000 years, you could, an ice age, you could have this structure develop into something that would retain these mites as well. Right. And then, so I guess the kind of like the big evidence would be for like finding some preserved bee that had perhaps like mites found, like maybe an amber. <laughs> oh my God, that would be, that would be the dream. And yes. you would be able to see like the difference between those structures. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If we found like a xylocopa from, I don't know, like a xylocopa of Virginica that had been preserved in amber that had mites on it. Because we know um, there are some xylocopa Virginica facultative, uh, obligate facultative mites. So they occur on that particular bee species. And they are somewhat beneficial, but the xylocopa don't have an extreme structure like this yet. So um, we could be in the process of seeing this happen, or we could go through those fossil records and, and hope that we could find something to sort of give us the pathway of how this evolved. I have a question that goes to the slide before the one you're showing now. You were saying something about uh, the male of one species carrying the mites to the female of another species. And last year I was recording videos of, of bee nests, solitary bees. And um, I, I, I recorded uh, Halcidius, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the other name, uh, male furrow bee um, coming out of the nest of a, of a small longhorn bee, um, a Melisodes. And so the, the male came out just shortly after I started recording the video. And then um, quite a while later, the female came out. Um, would that have been one of those mite transferring? Could that have been one of those mite transferring behaviors? So I, I sorry, I'm sorry if I misspoke before. Um, I think that let, lent to some confusion. So. These two bees here are the same species. These are right. two xylocopa um, fulginata. So it's the male fulginata that has the pronotal mites that could potentially transfer to the female fulginata during a copulation event. Uh. However, we talked about kleptoparasites and how the entry of those kleptoparasitic bees into the brood chamber of their host could actually be an unintentional mite deposit. That's the thing of it. It's not like the, the bees are, are hoping to scrape these mites off of their body. The mites are just there. And when the kleptoparasite enters the brood cell to lay their own egg, the, the mite will also drop to take advantage of that opportunity. So it could be a relationship like that that you did see. Okay. Um, Sarah, I have a question. Um, we're looking at this really, it's interesting, we're looking at it from the bee's perspective, but can you speak a little bit about how many of these mite species that you've discussed are obligate associates? to their bee partners, whatever, if they're commensals, parasites, symbionts, whatever. Or, I mean, obviously the ones that have made anatomical adaptations, you would think would be obligates, but are many or few of them able to survive on their own? 
So that is the thing with these mites is that a lot of them can jump uh, different orders of insects. So they can go to different hosts, not even considering the the you know the bees well-being or anything like that. So they can say like bees aren't around, I'm going to go after grasshoppers. So they can they can certainly or wasps. They can they can jump hosts pretty readily. And I'm going to cop out here and say there is not a lot known <laughs> about these mites. So for the most part they are considered commensal they're just around. The Ketodactylus is the main group that we know about that is deleterious to bees specifically. And then there's um, these other, there's, there's so many, there's hundreds of species of, of mites. So I would say for the most part, they're inert. They don't do a lot of damage to the bees. We don't know a lot about them because they're not, um, I don't want to say they're not important, but they don't affect the bees. So why, why would we study them is it at this point? So we need to kind of learn about these relationships and do um, genetic analyses of, you know, the, the phylo genetic relationships of bees, phylogenetic relationships of mites, and how they all fit together. But there are resources like this bee mite ID, which are trying very hard to find those relationships. So you can see here, this is actually a really good example, Marion. This bombus, they, they just group it into genus. So this bombus in the uh, order A stigmata, you can find a ton of different mites from A stigmata on these bombus. And unless it gets to the point of even too much weight on the bee, like this example here on the left, these mites don't really have an influence on these bees. So there's a ton of them and they're yeah, it's hard to it's hard to know what those relationships are, as well as host jumping. It's so okay. if you if you need to do a PhD, Marion, there's oh. a lot of work to do. Okay, well, I tried that; it didn't stick. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you. It's really interesting that they can jump orders. So, uh, yeah. So yeah. In, on a related question, we probably don't know if, um, like human activity that, um causes you know um bees to take over certain areas whether their mites are you know causing causing or not causing problems oh man because invasive of, mites right yeah yeah i mean that's how varroa got introduced right right so we are i mean we have we have osmium cornifrons. We have all kinds of different megachylidae that are coming in to uh, North America that may or may not have had mites on their body at, you know, point of entry. So it's, it's hard to know. And um, these things are really difficult to identify also. So if you if you do have a specimen of a few specimens of Lazioglossum in your collections, I would totally recommend checking them out. And if you have mites on them, you can do a very gentle removal and and create your own slides so you can look at them and compare them and and see if you can identify them. And who knows, like maybe the Washington Bee Society, Native Bee Society, will be on the forefront of determining whether or not we have invasive mites on <laughs> these invasive bees as well. Uh, it's a really interesting question, Tony. I, I do wonder though, uh, like it's not only invasive being a problem, would high density of like human raised like osmia be an issue uh, because the artificial environment might not offer the same balance as a natural environment and would that actually make 
mites more um, prevalent compared to a natural one? Yeah, I mean, this is just conjecture on my part. I would say that those artificial environments would give the opportunity to the deleterious mites as um, I think it was Aiden was asking about um, mites in osmia. Um, it would provide those environments where the mites could get really bad. But the good uh, uh, bee managers <laughs> may, I don't know, actually. Can anyone else um, address this question? I have not worked in an agricultural environment for solitary native bees for such a long time that I would not be able to answer this question. Does anyone else have any insights on that? Um, yeah, so my name is Mario Lapino. I'm a PhD student at WSU. Um, I actually study phoretic mites on bumblebees specifically. So um, in regards to um, raising a large number of any organism in a certain space, we do run into the problem of having pathogenic buildup. So just like we're seeing with the egg crisis right now, where we had this large influx of viruses in, <clears throat> excuse me, um, chickens, we are now seeing that in bumblebees as well. And so if we rear bumblebees in um, like greenhouse spaces, they can spill over into the environment and transmit those viruses and parasites out into the uh, <laughs> the local ecosystems. That is a really good point, Mario. Yes. Um, I got to say, like, uh, we, we are not the stewards of bees sometimes that we want to be, but we can only do better. <laughs> <laughs> um yes yeah well, Adrian just brought up a good point Adrian just brought up a good point too of burning the um uh, the nesting tubes and I and I think next month in February um Joe's going to be talking a bit about how he does his cleaning and everything and, and from my perspective too the first thing I thought of was just um you know, from a non-scientific perspective, perhaps uh, just the bird bird feeders and how that's transmitting. So I didn't even think about like thinking of it, like a chicken um, coop. Um, anyway, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I would love to uh, join you for that talk next month. Um, and- The best solution is, is, is having more bee diversity um, is, is I guess the converse of that answer. Yeah, I mean, our food production systems require some creative solutions. <laughs> and Mario, thank you for taking on a PhD for us. <laughs> um, and I, I also wanted to point out, I wasn't, I, I kind of intentionally didn't cover you social and primitively you social groups like Bombus Mario, but it's not because I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I love them, <laughs> but I wanted to talk about native solitary. Um, okay, so if you do really want to get into the nitty gritty of what mites you have in your collection, Mario, you can make slides of the mites that you find in your nesting materials in your little bumblebee pots and then um, look at them under a microscope. And there's a really good tool to assess what uh, mites you have, which right now their servers are down. They um, they think they'll be back up in two weeks and the <laughs> Bee Mite ID team will be able to assist you at that point. But yes, Bee Mite ID will provide a really solid resource of what you have. And it goes through the different orders of the, the mites. And then you can also select, as you see on the image on the right, what kind of, um, what bee you have. So pretty much genus, and then what, what mites are found on that. Known mites are found up to this point. All right, so I had a pile of resources for this. And I gotta say, I'm, I'm, I am not a mite expert. <laughs> I am. There's so much behind this that I just wasn't able to cover in this like super brief talk. So if you want to get in deep, I definitely uh, recommend some of the 
um, publications that came out. There was one in 2017. That was the one that showed the Xylocopa ruficeps, which is absolutely bonkers. This one by Klimov and O'Connor in 2007 was super, super cool. It, it did go into a little bit of the relationships um, of the, the mites in um, what they call abid bees, but again, those phylogenetic relationships have have changed in our in our current knowledge of things. Um, but it's still a, it, it applies. And then some classics like the studies of Holictiny, the Lazioglossum um, paper, and my beloved bees of the world. If you guys don't have a copy of that, please please put it by your bedside table. And another thing that's close to my heart, the solitary bees. So there's a a little bit of a, a primer to mites in their brood cell mutualist chapter. And it's just a good idea of um, what goes on in those tiny little worlds. So if anyone is interested in any of these publications and you do not have access, which is sad because paywalls exist, please get in touch with me. So I think, oh, that's it. Hooray. <laughs> I'll let you guys go get dinner or whatever you've been avoiding <laughs> to come to this meeting. But if you have questions, please let me know.